In these services from the Sermon on the Mount, we've seen how Jesus warned his listeners of a critical truth in four different ways. There are only two types of people in this world. There are the true followers of Christ that enter the narrow gate, trod the narrow way while producing good spiritual fruit, carrying out the Father's will, and applying the Lord's teachings to their lives. As we heard in the German service this morning, as they build their lives on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. That's the one group of people. The other group of people encompasses everyone else. Everyone who has a different master than our Lord and Savior. These various comparisons were meant to make Jesus' listeners consider their own lives and determine which group they belong to. Let's ask ourselves some questions at the beginning of this hour. Is the path we're currently on spacious? Is it lacking no earthly desire? Are we fixated on doing what we want and putting our ways and our needs before the needs of others? Do we see Jesus' teachings as mere interesting fables inapplicable to our everyday lives? If we answer these questions with a yes, then we are clearly on the broad way that leads to eternal separation from our wonderful God. But praise God, today is still a time of grace. A time of second chances where people can still bring their hearts, bring their lives, bring their sins to the Lord in faith and receive admission to the narrow way that leads to an eternity with him. Though Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount on a very somber note and self-reflecting note, the people couldn't help but notice how different his teachings were compared to anything else and everything else that they had ever heard. We read, The people were astonished at his teachings, for he taught them as one having authority. In these words, in this verse, we find the two main points that we want to briefly examine with our Lord and Savior's help this morning to close off these services. Firstly, we want to examine why Christ's teachings were astonishing. And then we want to briefly consider the authority with which he taught. Why were the people astonished by Christ's teachings in his Sermon on the Mount? First of all, because his teachings were so noticeably different than anything that they had ever heard before. Whereas the scribes and the religious leaders taught the law as something that predominantly dictated the outward lifestyle of the Jews, Jesus' teachings always went deeper. They always went to a different level. Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to help the people understand that God's expectations for his people go far deeper than what our eyes can see. His expectations always start in the heart. Jesus knew that the people that stood before him and were listening to him, they had a basic knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, but they didn't know how they could apply these scriptures to their lives personally. He wanted to give them real-life examples of children of God and how we can live out the law. And not just the law, but the fulfilled law in Jesus. And this is why Christ often said, You have heard that it was said of those of old. And then he says what? But I say to you. But I say to you. For example, Christ explained that if not careful, we can murder others through hatred in our hearts. He says, if we're not careful, we can commit adultery in our hearts and in our thoughts through lust. You see, these things are still feelings and, and desires and thoughts that if we do not take captive, if we do not stop them in their tracks, they grow into actions. 
And Jesus says, our hearts must be pure. Our thoughts must be pure. Our thoughts are something that nobody else can see. And I'm thankful. I am thankful that I cannot see the thoughts of others. Especially standing here this morning. Some people might be on a different channel than this channel. But it's good that we can't see the thoughts of one another. And some people think, well, if I sin in my thoughts or if I sin in my heart, why is that a problem? I'm not hurting anybody. Why does Jesus care? He does care. He cares because of what James writes in James chapter 1, verse 15. James 1, verse 15. James explains that sin is born in our hearts and in our minds. He says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then when sin is gr full grown, it brings forth death. You know, James was talking about people saying that God's tempting them. God tempts no one. Temptations come from our own desires. What will we do with them? Do we allow them to play out? Or do we bring them to the Lord? There is a common expression that says, you can't prevent a bird from flying over your head but you can most certainly prevent a bird from making its nest on your head. Isn't that true? We actually have a new children's book that we just purchased that explains this very well. Loved ones, will we all be tempted in our thoughts? Every one of us. The question is, what do we do with those thoughts? Do we, do, do we take them, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, captive and bring them to our Lord and Savior and make them obedience to him, obedient to him? Or do we allow them to play out? Christ wants to keep our hearts from sin. The Proverbs writer Solomon says in uh, Proverbs 4, verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. And this is something that is drastically different than what the world tells us today. The world tells us that we are to follow our hearts. To follow our hearts, our hearts will never lead us astray. A heart that has not been given over to Jesus Christ will lead us astray. Our hearts are inherently selfish. But when we give our hearts to Jesus, and he cleanses them, makes them pure, makes them white as snow, and allow him to live in our hearts, then we can trust our hearts because they match God's expectations of us. Jesus wants to live in our hearts and there's not enough room in our hearts for Jesus and sin. There isn't. He refuses to live in our hearts if we allow sin to make its home in our hearts. He wants our hearts to be reserved for him, for God alone. And though no man can see our thoughts, God's word tells us that every thought and every motive will be one day judged on Judgment Day. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Not only did Christ's teachings go far deeper than the typical teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus often directly exposed the hypocrisy of the religious leaders during his time. This made his teachings astonishing, not to mention incredibly controversial. We see these actually, this kind of a thing happening in our uh, media these days with our dear president, not afraid to bring up controversial issues or even to sometimes blame certain people who decide rather to hide or to cover certain issues up instead of deal with them. And this, of course, brings a lot of hatred towards him. The same thing happened to Jesus. By exposing the sins of the religious leaders, he made a lot of enemies. Not because he did something wrong, but because he is light, he is truth, and light always shines in darkness and exposes what's in the darkness. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus numerous times exposes the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. I'd like to share three verses with us that we find in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, uh, 
First of all, Matthew 6, verse 2. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 2, verse eight, uh, part 8 of verse 2, When you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. The hypocrites referring to their religious leaders. Verse 5, Matthew 6, verse 5, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their face, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Loved ones, is it wrong to do good, to give? Is it wrong to fast, to pray? These are all parts of a Christian's life. Giving. Out of love to God and mankind. To, to pray to God. To fast. Jesus expects this of his followers. But if we do them with the wrong motives, with wicked intent, then Jesus calls us out as he calls, called them out. And he calls us hypocrites. Jesus exposed the hidden sinful motives that many of the religious leaders had for doing the pious things they did. Now, how do you think the people felt when they heard how hypocritical their religious leaders were? They felt betrayed. I believe that. When religious leaders profess one thing and live a different life. They felt betrayed. They felt hurt. And how do you think the religious leaders felt when they heard Jesus say these things openly against them? Exposed. Angry. Humiliated. Again, not because Jesus did something wrong. He is our great judge. But because he revealed their hypocrisy before the people. The way that Jesus exposed the religious leaders during his Sermon on the Mount, and then later again in chapter 27, or sorry, chapter 23, and I'd like to encourage us, if we have time to read chapter 23, to see how his light shone in chapter 23 and exposed all sorts of hypocrisy. But the way he exposed them is a brief example of what Judgment Day will one day look like, where Jesus, as our judge, will bring to light every thought, every word, every deed that we've ever committed. Every one. And he will praise us and reward us if these things align with his teachings. But if not, he must condemn and he must punish because he is an upright, righteous, and holy judge. And this thought is especially serious for people in positions of religious leadership, because others look to them as an example of what it means to, to, to be te uh, teachers, or teachers of Christ's doctrine and Christ's word. Even the Apostle Paul. When we think of Paul, we think of a great evangelist, we think of a missionary, we think of someone who was able with the grace and help and leading of God to plant many churches. He wrote many wonderful things that we, we refer to today. But Christ even put this burden on Paul's heart that he needed to be careful. He writes in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, Paul writes, But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Most religious leaders, I truly believe, start off with righteous motives. But because of temptations, and every person, no matter who they are on this planet, is tempted. Because of temptations, our pure motives can become tainted. And James writes in chapter 3, verse 1, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, fortunately, the religious leaders, when Jesus exposed them, they still had time to make things right. They still had time and grace to bring these sins, these hidden motives to the Lord. 
Unfortunately, few did. We know of two who did. Can someone name one of them? Nicodemus. Yeah. Who came to Jesus by night. Yeah, and who else? Joseph of Arimathea. Both of them belonged to the high council of the Jews. Both of them became disciples of Jesus. And I, I find it wonderful that there are examples of these religious leaders who humbled themselves before God and became his disciples. The people were astonished at Christ's teachings because they were different. They were so different than anything they had ever heard before. They went far deeper. The people were astonished because Christ's teachings exposed hypocrisy and created at times great controversy. And yet the biggest reason why the people were astonished is because Christ taught differently. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And this is our second main point that we want to still briefly touch on this morning, Christ's authority. We do not have authority. There is one who has authority, and that is Christ. We can speak through Christ's authority. We can allow God's authority to speak through us, but he is the sole uh, owner of authority. One author says, Scribes would often cite different authorities in order to lend credence to their statements. Jesus' words were self-authenticating. Note his phrase, but I say to you, at Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Another scholar adds, Jesus spoke with a new authority, his own. He didn't need to quote another source because he was the original word. There was nobody to quote before him. He is God. And this author is referring to what John writes in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. John 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus, and without him nothing was made that was made. With these words, John professes Christ's self-existing divinity. That means his being is dependent on nothing else. He's self-existing. He is God. As the word of God, Christ is without fault and saturated in truth. His omnipotence or his almighty power is displayed in his creation of all things. Jesus has no need to cite others in order to lend credence to his statements because he is God. His authority is supreme, and his word is always amen. Before sending his disciples into all the world with the Great Commission, Jesus validated his command with the words in Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Loved ones, is there anybody else on this planet who ever lived who could have said these words? All authority and on heaven and on earth has been given to me. And yet Jesus could say it because he is God. And if we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, equal to the Father, then the Sermon on the Mount and all of Christ's teachings is equal in importance to the law of Moses that God gave Moses at the Mount Sinai. Have we ever thought of that? That every teaching of Christ can be placed at an evil level to the great law of God from the Old Testament. But I say to you, Jesus says over and over again, God himself is instructing us as to how we ought to live before him. And he outlines his very high moral standard for us. Because if we take his name, then we ought to live a life that resembles our father. If we call ourselves children of God, then God ought to be seen in us. He has a high moral standard for us. And what shall we do then if we decide to neglect his standard that he has made so clear? Hebrews 2 verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? We shall not. If we know God's law and ignore it and neglect it, 
and reject it, we will not escape. The people realized that Jesus taught with a different kind of authority than the scribes. And a scholar says, the consciousness of divine authority as lawgiver, as expounder, and as judge so beamed through Jesus' teachings that the scribes' teachings could not but appear driveling in such a light. There's no comparison. Through Jesus' teachings, the people were receiving something that the scribes knew they could not offer the people. And they knew that they would no longer be satisfied with what they could offer them. I think many of us have experienced similar things in our lives. When I was a young teenager, I would uh, at times attend a different uh, church. And there was many things that I loved about that church. Many things. But there's one thing that I could not overcome. The teaching of once saved, always saved. I got saved, or I went up front in an altar call in that church. And then in that sermon, or that pastor told me, and now because you're saved, you can live like you want. And God will always have you, you will always be his child. And there, at that moment, I realized this cannot be the case. I want something more than what I have now. Why give my life to Jesus if I cannot overcome sin? Why did he die for me then? if I still have to live this kind of life. And then I heard the, the, the teaching of freedom from sin through obedience and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Taught at the Church of God and loved ones, I was no longer satisfied with the teaching of one saved, always saved. I found something better I found something better. It's because truth opens hearts. Truth reveals. Jesus says, the truth will set you free. That's what truth does. I wanted to be free. And the scribes and the Pharisees could sense that the people were receiving such great life, a light from Jesus' teaching that they would never again be satisfied with their teachings. They knew Jesus taught differently. He taught with authority, and he taught with miraculous signs which validated his authority. Unfortunately, because of their ever-increasing hatred toward Jesus, many of the religious leaders refused to accept him and sought rather a way to destroy him. They knew that their best shot at finding an accusation against Jesus or a reason to have Jesus killed was to attack his authority in his claim of being God, something that we call blasphemy. Blasphemy was punishable by death. And they started to openly question his authority. Matthew 21, 23 says, Matthew 21, verse 23, Now when Jesus came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted Jesus as he was teaching, and, he said, and they said, But what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus, knowing their hearts, was is able to evade their trap. But once the time had come for him to give his life as the perfect lamb of God for the sins of the world, he accepted their title. He knew it was time. And in Luke 22, verse 70, Luke 22, verse 70, the Bible says, Then they all asked him, his accusers, Are you then the Son of God? And so he answered to them, You rightly say that I am. The actions and attitudes of these religious leaders seem to me at first disgusting, inexcusable. And yet there are many still today who recognize the authority of Christ, who would never deny that, but fail to accept and apply his teachings. They, like the Pharisees, prefer rather to rid themselves of Christ than to accept his lordship in their life. They want to get rid of Jesus. They want to get rid of his teachings. They just want to be called Christians. A Christian means to be a little Christ. 
to be a follower of Christ, to be like Christ. But those who recognize and accept Christ's authority can rest in the fact that they have the Almighty God on their side. As we heard this morning, when we have built our lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ, we have the Almighty God on our side, who spoke with such authority and speaks with such authority even today, 2,000 years later, through his word. It's because of his, his word that my life was trans transformed. It's because of his authority that still exists in his word today that many others are able to serve the Lord today as well. In the year 1446 BC, approximately 1500 years before Christ, a newly freed people gathered together at the base of Mount Sinai. And God's presence was on the top of the mountain in the form of a thick cloud, exploding with thunder and lightning and terrified the people through earthquakes. We read about this at the beginning of this hour. And because of the people's unworthiness to meet with God, God chose to meet with Moses alone on top of the mountain to give him the law. Jesus, near the start of his earthly ministry, had a great following. A great multitude followed him. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, sat down, and taught them. He didn't teach them a different law. He helped them to understand how he fulfilled it. He didn't thunder or shake the earth with his voice. He opened his heart and showed the people what it means to love God above all and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Christ's teachings still contain the same love and the same authority and his teachings are still just as applicable to our lives today, 2,000 years later. They are the key that we need in order to have a personal relationship with God through the, through the blood of Jesus. Without Christ's teachings, we have nothing. But through them, we have the power of God at our fingertips. And after closing his sermon, the scripture says in Matthew 8, verse 1, When Jesus had come from the, from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Loved ones, I'm so thankful that we can belong to the multitude of God today through Jesus Christ. All those who accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and have had their hearts cleansed through his atoning work and grace belong to this following of God. Now, as Bible readers, we know that this following disappeared eventually. More and more people realized that what Jesus wanted of them was a hard thing. He wants us all, all of us, our whole lives, our whole hearts, every part. But if we do so, if we lay our lives in the hands of our Lord, he can turn us into something wonderful, something new, a tool in his hand to change this world and spread his kingdom. To have this authority today to go and make disciples of all nations, that is a great responsibility. May we never take it for granted. We have the Almighty on our side. Let us not neglect him. Over these last days, we have seen so many different ways that people reject Christ. People would rather serve their own lusts. People would rather serve money. People would rather serve the things of this world like Judas than to serve God. But we've also seen over and over again that this life is limited. One day the end will come. Judgment day will come. And then we will have not one excuse to hide behind. Jesus says we will see him, and Paul says and we will see him as he is. Will we be ready? 